In this video, we're going to talk about Motherport, trading under the ticker symbol MTTR. Before the video begins, just a quick heads up that not all my videos are made on the same day they're posted. If there are material events happening afterwards, I'm going to make a follow-up video to reflect those changes. With that being said, let's go on to today's video. Motherport is a data company operating in 3D construction of space and virtual environment. Their platforms allow clients to experience immersive simulations of different environments going from office space to apartment to facilitate the design, identification, and optimization of virtual environments. You may have seen 3D virtual tours available on different websites for apartment and office rentals. This is what Matterport offers, and this is the kind of services but with more realistic and higher quality images. It has already assisted hundreds of thousands of clients around the world ever since it was established. Its unique suite of tools also allowed users to edit and add comments on space itself, allowing information to flow through different parties much more easily. One of Matterport's proprietary tools is called Matterport Cortex AI, scanning and identifying objects within a room and recreate space that can feel as if users are physically within those environments. Looking at Matterport from a fundamental and equity perspective, I believe that the company itself stands on a lot of potentials for the years and decades to come, especially when it comes to growth of metaverse over the past few months. The fact that the vast majority of its shareholders are retail traders should send us some signals on how metaverse stocks in general but Matterport in particular may be considered by institutional money at this moment. Whether we agree or not with their assessment, it suffice to say that their capital right now is unwilling to participate at this current stage. Some of this reluctance may be caused by the growth history of virtual reality stocks over the years. There may have been some people adopting these equipments and willing to dive in headfirst into the virtual environment, sure, but they have remained a limited portion of the overall population, and that overall, the reality hasn't really changed over time. I was talking about how the technology of Matterport can be used in virtual tours, and keep in mind that this technology can also have a much cheaper alternative, with agents taking photos of these environments and sending them on or posting them to the websites or sending them to the potential clients. This is why although the technology may be technically interesting, there is a real argument over there whether the technology has enough short-term demand to justify higher stock price. Speaking of higher stock price, its recent stock performance has been under a lot of selling pressure. I believe that the current market correction is not over yet and that we still have to wait and see for at least another 8 to 12 weeks before the price begins to recover. This is, of course, on the safe side. The fundamentals are not justifying the stock price as we speak, and the market participants at large have adopted this point of view. The stock began trading in early 2021 and has since then found a relatively strong support zone between $8 and $15, which has been pierced through recently. We have to wait and see when the stock will correct itself and if so, whether your portfolio is sufficiently diversified to include Matterport in your portfolio. Now, let's move on to Matterport's technicals. The trading volume of Matterport has recently been 13.9 million shares compared to an average volume of 14.4 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $7.50 and $37.60. The market cap of Matterport is currently at $2.1 billion, compared to an enterprise value of $4.3 billion. The difference between the market cap and the enterprise value is the premium or discount financial market is willing to allocate to the company, based on its current fundamentals, leverage, and asset composition. Some of the examples of impact by leverage is if the company has a lot of debt, then the market may feel uncertain about a company's capacity to pay back 
its interests and principles, which in turn may negatively impact its profitability, attractiveness, and even solvency. One key element to note regarding enterprise value is that for many growth type companies, one of their most significant assets is called goodwill. Goodwill is basically an expectation of the market that the company is able to generate more profit or to have more growth than another company, partially because it has a good management, stronger brand recognition, bigger following online, and so on. It is basically what is unique about a company in particular compared to another alternative competitor within the same sector. In other words, it's not a tangible asset that companies can use, but it's often the reason why some companies are perceived to be trading at a discount, because the market cap is lower than the enterprise value, which is the value the market gives to its assets once all the debts are paid off. In case of companies going to liquidation, goodwill may be completely liquidated first, and we would be left with potentially less assets to distribute to shareholders and debt holders than the figures shown on the balance sheet. In comparison to its historical price fluctuations, the stock is 16.3% higher than the one-month low, 16.3% higher than the three-month low, and 16.3% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which often gives a hint on the market sentiment on where the stock price is likely going to head toward next, the implied volatility is 123% compared to a historical volatility of 95.6%. The put-call ratio is currently at 0.71. It is normal for most stocks to also tend to have a slightly higher put option volume than what they deserve because many institutional investors choose to hedge their exposure by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 19,000 contracts a day, compared to the 30-day average of 20,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 249,000 contracts compared to a 30-day average of 251,000 contracts. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders hold about 6% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Fidelity, Vanguard, and Morgan Stanley. Understanding shareholder structure is relevant to an extent because it helps to determine whether you should hold the stock long-term or to view it as a short-term volatility play. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, then it may be a sign that the stock is not currently justified for long-term holdings, at least in the eyes of institutional shareholders. Usually, the consensus is that there should be at least 25 to 30 percent of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade opportunity. This is obviously subjected to a lot of exceptions since Many titles are excellent and mostly held by retail investors as well. But in the grand scheme of things, that tends to be the exceptions and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of position or money that aim to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes when there are significant short interest in the total volume, it could be a sign that there is an organized shorting operation going on like what has been going on with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 10.53% of the total float and 35.9% of the dark pool transactions. Now, let's also take a look at the indicators. Financial indicators give us a suggestion of what the price movements are showing, and they can be used as one of the elements to determine what should be our overall approach. Oscillators are showing zero sell, 9 neutral, and 2 buy, with an overall tendency of buy. The moving averages of the past price actions show 14 sell, 1 neutral, and 0 buy. The overall tendency, from the perspective of moving averages, is to sell. Keep in mind that indicators often show the present and the past performances of the stock, but rarely predicts accurately the future. Nevertheless, they are relevant to determine if the current timing of your trade is the right one. In terms of pivot points, which are levels of support and resistance sprinkled in the price trends, the support levels so far seem to be $5.96, $7.22, and $7.58. 
For the resistance levels, they are $18.12, $21.28, and $26.51. The overall opinion on Matterport that I have is that we should be careful not to get in too soon and to end up holding the bag. Metaverse is a relatively new trending topic amongst retail traders, sure, but it has been around for fairly a long time as a tech concept. One final thing to keep in mind is that Matterport's price action may be closely following on the one of other growth stocks in general, as investors are now re-evaluating whether they should keep that much capital in this sector. My recommendation is to reserve around 0.5 to 1% of your portfolio for Matterport stock when it eventually recovers. Right now, we have to see for at least a week whether the price stops falling before considering buying back once again. We're not at that stage at the moment, even if, in my opinion, the sell-off has been slowing down across the board, but we still have to wait and see. In this current market environment, I believe that we should be careful about taking positions and risk in the financial market in general, and in the equity market in particular. Because over the past decade or so, the financial market has been living with the help of newly created capital from QEs, resulting in a massive increase of asset prices and the corresponding decrease in their yields. And the low interest rate also contributed to reinforce this phenomenon because the financial sector would see its profit margins reduced and in turn keeps the returns of other sectors and employees low as well. At the same time, the market doesn't represent the real economy, and the real economy doesn't get reflected in the price of different securities. The market is a game of supply and demand, which will depend on a number of factors, not just the fundamentals. If the asset prices only depend on the fundamentals, then their performances in the Northern Hemisphere would have been more than mediocre because things have been mostly stagnant over the years. A few things can explain why asset prices managed to remain high despite the stagnation of the underlying businesses. The first one is that over the years, there has been more money printed by different central banks to support their own economies. But because that money is distributed to banks and expected to loan to businesses to create more jobs, and that, in fact, there aren't that many opportunities out there. This money became capital that travels around the world and went into the huge financial melting pot. The QEs are now wrapping up in many countries, so I don't think that it'll remain as the main driving force over the next couple of years to keep the asset prices up. But it's compensated by the arrival of new capital from different regions to North America because it's perceived as a safe haven for investors. With the rising tensions around the world, this capital inflow will probably be sustained over the next couple of years, if not intensifying. The last phenomenon is the creation of artificial bubbles that are either supported by real market trends or completely fictional ones to allow market participants to play the game of hot potato and to either create profits or to safe keep their capital. The EV sector back in 2020 is an excellent example of this. But nevertheless, what it means for the market is that The degree of uncertainty is probably going to increase over the foreseeable future as the expectation for a recession has been building up for more than a decade and that the economic difficulties are accumulating around the world, especially from Asia. What this means for the market and for us is that the volatility is supposed to increase over time, which will provide opportunities to make a profit or to incur losses, depending on the timing and risk management. Another thing to note for this period of time is that we have to be very careful about having shorts. It's already riskier than having longs because the losses of shorts are not limited, right? Because there's no limit in terms of how far the stock can increase. But 
With the increased involvement of short sellers, I believe that the stocks been shorted will have an even higher probability of getting squeezed, which will result in potentially massive losses. So we're also like observing more of an irrational behavior from market participants in the sense that very often people will choose to rush in a position, not necessarily because the fundamentals are convincing, but because there's a buildup of demand in a specific stock and people will pile in to ride the gravy train with the rest of us. That kind of behavior is highly risky and may result in losses. It's worth pointing out that in 2020 and probably in 2021, the market has never presented that many opportunities. But it was also during that same period of time that many retail traders have incurred their biggest losses. A rule of thumb is that each position should be structured so that even if they don't succeed, they don't impact the portfolio stability. Positions should begin small so that there is an opportunity to average down later. And specifically for the growth stocks, I think that 5 to 10% overall should be a healthy weight for the portfolio. And each stock should represent about 1 to like 3% of the positions. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.